Welcome to another Monday night live stream. What I wanted to do is start kind of fresh and start going over prophecies. And we want to look at end time prophecy for our age. We want to fill in the gaps with the Dead Sea Scrolls and comments from the church fathers. And we're going to try to make uh, the teachings concise. On Monday nights, we will have a Q&A afterwards. But we're going to try to pull all these things together. So tonight, we're going to start basically at the very beginning. So we understand that Bible prophecy talks about things relating to Christ, to the end times, to Israel, and things like that. The basic overview to start on Bible prophecy is the book of Daniel. So we're going to go through that. Then, if we follow the directions from the Dead Sea Scrolls, we follow the teachings of the School of the Prophets. So we'll look at some of the patriarchal writings and uh, how they interpret the minor prophets. And then we will go forward from there. And what we really want to find out is you've probably heard about uh, the fall of the Roman Empire, the ten nations that come up, uh, and the Antichrist and the seven-year tribulation period. So we're going to pull those together piece by piece, make those crystal clear, and then we can speculate on how we add them together or what happens. So you've probably heard people say the Antichrist might be the president of the United States, one of the ones that you don't like, for instance. Uh, that's not possible because the Antichrist comes, according to Daniel 11, from a nation north of Israel. That's not the United States. We're far, far west. Um, so anyway, we're going to ta talk about things like that. So for tonight, let's get started looking at Daniel. So in Daniel uh, chapter 2, there is a dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. And this dream is this statue. Now, if we read chapter 2, he basically says he has a dream. It scared him senseless. But he began to forget the pieces of it when he woke up. And you've probably had dreams like that. You know there was something, but you can't quite remember what it was. So he asks all the wise men to tell him the dream and interpret the dream. If they're wise and godly and connected with gods and spirits, they ought to be able to do that pretty easy. Well, none of them could. So he says, well, apparently y'all are liars. I'm going to execute you all. Well, Daniel says, let me go very logically, home, pray, let me go to sleep and see if the Lord will show me what he showed you. And then if I know what the dream is, I'll come back and tell you and interpret it. So he comes back to him and says, this was the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar, you know how when you vaguely begin to remind you of something, it's like, yes, that was it. So then Daniel interprets the dream. And for us, this is the basic foundation of Bible prophecy. So let's look at this. Here is a, a chart of basically what Nebuchadnezzar saw. And we're going to read it in a minute. But he sees this large image. And in this large image, everybody was worshiping it and this kind of stuff. And uh, it's terrifying, whatever it is. And this stone cut from out hands, like this big meteorite, came out of the heavens, hit the thing at its feet, destroyed the entire thing, and then kind of swelled up and became a kingdom on the earth or something like that. So that's what he saw, and it terrified him. He has no clue what he, any of this means. So let's go to Daniel, and we'll come back to this uh, picture. And those, I'm going to try to do drawings like this also on the website, so you can just grab the pictures. Once you know the, the teachings fairly well, if you have the photos, so to speak, of the dreams or the images, um, you can understand it a lot better. So here is Daniel chapter 2. And let's see here. Let's get to verse 31. So Daniel basically says, here's the dream. And then now here's the interpretation. So we'll read this. Daniel 2, 31 says, You, O king, saw and behold, there was a great image. This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before you. And the form thereof was terrible. And that, that word can mean bad or it can mean just like awesome. It was just like so intense. This image's head was of fine gold. Its breast and arms were silver. Its belly and thighs were of brass. Its legs were of iron. Its feet and 
or its feet were partly of iron and partly of clay. And that's just weird, but these things mean something. It says you saw or were looking at it, in other words, until a stone was cut without hands. It's not a human made stone. It's whoever carved this image apparently was a human. This is made without human hands. But it came, it says, and it smote the image on its feet that were of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. So then there was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken into pieces together, and it became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away, and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the entire earth. So this stone actually hit it, crushed it, basically ground it to powder to the point that it was, there was a wind and it just totally ceased to exist. And then this, this stone, however big it was, continued to expand until it filled the earth, became a great mountain. Now, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, mountains are usually thought of as kingdoms or empires. I shouldn't say kingdom, I should say empire. There's a difference. So he says, this is the dream, and we will tell you the interpretation before the king. So that's the dream, and now he remembers vaguely, yeah, that was it. So he says, you, O king, are a king of kings. He's, he rules an empire over lots of different uh, city, states, and countries. So he's a king of kings. For God, the God of heaven, has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Everything that we have is given to us by God. And it says, wherever the children of men dwell, that's the entire known earth at that point, the empire, everybody in the Middle East, wherever anybody dwells, he has control over them. Um, so wherever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of heaven, has given into your hands, he has, and hath made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So sometimes in these symbols, you'll have fowls and animals and people and objects representing nations or kingdoms. So you might have a lion representing one country and a bear representing another country. We'll see that later in other chapters. But he rules over all of these kingdoms or these these things because he is the head of an empire. It's very important. So he is the head of gold. And this is the first place where people get confused. Are we talking about Nebuchadnezzar as a person? Like, in other words, if someone comes after him, is that his son just taking over the same kingdom and when he dies? Or you're talking about a different empire. Does the empire fall to someone else? It's like a dynasty. Are we talking about a person or a dynasty? So it says here, um, you are this head of gold. And then he explains it in verse 39 by saying, after you, it's Nebuchadnezzar, okay, shall arise another kingdom. So it's not his son or anything. Now, at this point, we stop just for a second. If we took time to study Isaiah and several other prophecies, several of the prophecies in Isaiah, and we will in time study those, talk about the fact that there, were, when Nebuchadnezzar takes Israel, there will be three generations, and then it will fall to the Medes and the Persians, specifically a guy named Cyrus. So three generations, it's Nebuchadnezzar, his son, his grandson, and then the kingdom falls. So at this point, we're talking about, for sure, another nation. So somebody comes in and destroys the Babylonian Empire and forms their own empire. So he says, after you shall arise another kingdom inferior, in some sense it's inferior to the Babylonian empire. I don't know how, but this kingdom is gonna be a kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And, and the word earth here is Eretz in Hebrew, and it can mean the entire globe, or it can mean the land. And I think we're talking here about the prophecy being the land of Israel. The whole concept here is that some nation may go tack and take over some other nation, but it has nothing to do with Israel, nothing to do with the Messiah. It has nothing to do with Bible prophecy. 
some country in Africa takes over some other country in, you know, Middle East or Africa or something, and it has nothing to do with Israel at all, it wouldn't be in Bible prophecy. So it will bear rule over the entire land, including Israel, basically. Then there shall be, it's the kingdom of brass. Then a fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. Seems like I mixed over it. Oh, okay. Uh, a kingdom inferior and then a third kingdom. So this second kingdom is the kingdom of silver. And let me just hop back here real quick. Uh, we're looking at this thing. We have a head of gold. We have chest and arms of silver. And then belly and thighs of brass. Legs of iron. And then ten toes of iron and clay. That's the image. So he, Nebuchadnezzar or Babylon is this head of gold. After him, he, his son, his grandson. Babylonian kingdom will fall. Isaiah tells us to the Medes and Persians. So we know we're talking about empires. So at a certain point, the Medes and the Persians will come and take over all the area of Babylon, including Israel. So they will be the rulers. They will rule for a time until another kingdom comes in and takes over. And that's whatever this brass kingdom is. Brass or bronze, it can be interpreted different. But the main idea is to understand this is gold silver a copper alloy of some side people get hung up on whether this is brass or bronze because it may or may not mean something else it's just a different form of alloy different metals mixed with copper and then there's iron we know what iron is and then iron mixed with clay and clay uh we think of, all of these are metals and it's important to know we look at clay and think clay is not metal it's just dirt basically well, it's not actually. Clay hardens when you uh, bake it, basically. But one of the main ingredients in clay is aluminum and something that they didn't identify way back when. So in reality, we're talking about gold, silver, copper alloy of some sort, iron, and iron mixed with aluminum, however that works. Okay? So let's go back and look at this again. So this is what he says. Kingdom of, of brass is third, and then a fourth kingdom will be as strong as iron. And inasmuch as iron breaks and subdues all things, if you were to take silver and make a silver sword and a gold sword and try to hit each other, the gold sword would fall apart a lot quicker than the silver would. Silver against brass, brass would destroy it easy. Iron against that would destroy pretty easy. So each one of these metals gets stronger and stronger until we get to aluminum. But we'll, we'll figure that part out here in a little bit. Okay, so then it says, Whereas you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay, the aluminum, partly of iron, the, string, the kingdom shall be divided, divided, and in it shall be the strength of the iron, for as much as you saw iron mixed with miry clay. So it's going to be divided, partially strong, partially weak. As for the toes of the feet, they were part of iron and part of clay. So the feet are one thing, the toes are another. And that's one thing I want you to, to figure out real here in, in just a second. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Whereas you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to the other, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So if I tried to make a stand of iron on one side and aluminum or clay, either one, on the other side, it's <coughs> not going to hold together well. Now let's stop there in a second, but well, let's go ahead and finish reading this. In the days of these kings... This is important. This The kings, these ten toes. Uh, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven set up a kingdom which is never be will never be destroyed. The kingdom will not be left to another people, but shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms and shall stand forever. So that's what we call the messianic kingdom. Not the toes, but the big rock that was cut without hands not human-made kingdom, comes to earth from heaven. That's the millennial kingdom. 
For as much as you saw the stone was cut out of a, the mountain without hands, and it broke in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. Now, Daniel, we'll get to this in another study, but Daniel knows the interpretation is sure because he has records from Noah, and that's a different prophecy, but it relates to this directly. So it's really, really important we get this understood or part of it, the main part. Then we look at Noah's Testament. Then we look at a few other things and we go forward. So let's look at the chart again. So in 607 BC, the Babylonian Empire took over Israel. Okay, and then in what in I think 597 they took more captives in 687. They they uh, in each time they destroyed the temple, and they continued to rule as um, Jeremiah had prophesied for 70 years. The end of which in 537 BC the Persian Empire conquered the Babylonians, and we can talk about the historical records and the other prophecies in Isaiah sometime. But basically, we're told in Daniel 2.38 that Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. And after him is another kingdom or empire. So this head of gold is Babylon ruling over Israel, starting with Nebuchadnezzar, and then his son, and then his grandson. And then some guy named Cyrus with Darius comes in and takes over the kingdom. And we see this in Daniel 5, 30, and 31. So let's look at that real quick. Daniel 5, 30, to see what it says. 30 and 31. So this is um, Belshazzar, which is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. So it's three generations in. They're having a party because they think they cannot be destroyed. There's Medes and Persians outside the walls trying to break in, and they think there's no way they can. They'll get fed up with it and quit and leave one day. In the meantime, we'll just have a party. So this is going on and this strange hand appears and writes on the wall. You've heard about the handwriting on the wall. Amazing prophecy for another time. But at this point, Nebuchadnezzar, or um, Daniel rather, explains what's going on. And that very night, the prophecies are fulfilled. It's 70 years to the day and the prophecies are fulfilled. And it says that night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians was slain. And Darius the Mede took the kingdom being about three score and two years. It's important that we know he was 62 when he took it because it relates to another prophecy. But so this shows us that the Babylonian empire falls to the Medes and the Persians, which we also get from Isaiah and other places. So going back to our chart, we have the Babylonian empire the Persian Empire, and that lasts until 323 BC when it's taken over by the Grecian Empire. Well, Daniel tells us that too in Daniel 8, 20, and 21. So let's look at that. If we go to Daniel 8, 20, and 21, it says this is a vision he sees of a ram and a goat. And so the goat is ruling. This ram comes out of nowhere and destroys the goat. And in, if we read this prophecy, we understand that the goat is, is, is um, uh, Greece and the ram is Persia. And so this goat comes and destroys it. So it says, the ram that you saw having the two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. The rough goat, or it's, it's actually a uni goat, it's a goat with one horn at this point, uh, is the king of Greece. That's Alexander the Great. And there's a lot of other prophecies uh, going along with that. The great horn between his eyes is the first king. So Greece unites together to form an empire. And the first king of that united empire is that horn in this prophecy. And that's Alexander the Great. For our purposes, all we need to know is that the Medes and the Persian Empire falls to the Grecian Empire. So when we go back to here, the Grecian Empire is the copper brass or, or whatever, but the copper alloy kingdom. Very, very important. And historically, we know this because 607, um, Babylon takes over the area of the Middle East, Israel, and it falls to the Medes and Persians in 537. 
exactly 70 years later, which is interesting because the prophecy said it would be exactly 70 years later. And then in 323, Alexander the Great conquers the Persian Empire. And at that point, Alexander dies and the empire is partitioned into four pieces. We'll see that later. But basically, two pieces have nothing to do with Israel. And we have a north and a south empire. And from that time forward, they are major problems for Israel. And we see that in chapter 11 and several other things. So at this point, then, the Grecian Empire ruling between these two, Israel being in the center, being conquered by the north and conquered by the south, and conquered by the north, conquered by the south, just keeps doing this for a long time. Uh, eventually, they gain some independence when Rome begins to come in and conquers the uh, Egypt first and then goes up and conquers Syria. And in the process, Rome ex accepts Israel as being a sovereign nation that is no threat. So they have about a 100-year period, the Maccabean period, of where they dwell safely. But then, uh, long story short, Rome comes in and conquers Israel with Pompeii, and that was 64 BC. And we see this in Daniel 11.30. So if we go to Daniel 11, and this is all about that Grecian kingdom, when you get down to verse 30, it says, for the ships of Chittim, or Kittim, that's the Hebrew word for Cyprus and Rome. So this is the Roman Empire coming in to destroy the, the uh, Grecian Empire that's left. So the ships of Kittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved, return, and have indignation against the Holy Covenant, and shall do even return and have intelligence. And it goes on and talks about uh, the rest of the stuff, the polluting of the sanctuary. And this is Antiochus Epiphanes and those things that happen. But he falls, ultimately, it takes time to the ships of Chittim or the Roman Empire. Okay. And the Roman Empire is ruling when we get to Matthew chapter one and Jesus is born. The Romans are ruling. So here's the thing then. So we see from Daniel that Israel is going to be ruled over by Babylon. And that was from 607 to 537 BC. Then they were to be ruled over by the Persian Empire. That was from that actually happened from 537 to 323. Then they're ruled over by the Grecian Empire, which a lot of variants, but it's all detailed in Daniel, from 323 to 64 BC. Basically, that's that time period. From 64 on is the Roman Empire. Now we know in 70 AD the temple was destroyed. And then there was a Bar Kokhba rebellion in 135. So then Israel ceased to exist. The Roman Empire continued to rule that entire area for centuries. And that's what we want to look at to try to figure this out. So the Roman Empire starts off as an empire. But if you notice up here, you've got the head of gold, which is the Babylonian Empire at the time, the chest and arms of silver, like the Medes and the Persians, the two pieces, then there's the Grecian Empire that starts as one and fragments. Uh, and then Rome, most importantly, is iron, but it starts as one and fragments into two. And what we want to see here is this is the eastern and the western divisions of the Roman Empire. This is really important because, number one, we're talking about two legs. Um, and it wasn't until 395 AD that the Roman Empire actually divided into two pieces. So it's one Roman Empire, which is pagan. And then somewhere along the line, it becomes Christian uh, in name only, at least. I mean, it, it goes from being pagan to Christian generally. But then it also splits into two. We're going to look at this in much greater detail later. But these two pieces continue for a long time. Now, what's interesting is just to take this and understand this, if the division right here starts 325, 395 rather, almost 400 AD, what happens in history is that Rome continues, has lots of problems. They create a new Roman Empire that Rome itself, originally when the empire was formed way back in the beginning, the capital was a city called Alba. And they, that was the ruling headquarters for the kings. 
for about 400 years until Rome was completed. And then Rome, Italy, Rome actually was the head of the empire for centuries. Well, at a certain point, they decided to create Constantinople. And then when that was created, the Caesars actually picked up and moved to Constantinople and left Rome ruling with other people. So it was like two brothers at first, and then it just continued. So what's interesting then, 395 is the split. A lot of times, and you may have heard the Roman Empire fell in 476. Well, kind of. It kind of did. In 476, Western Rome, the empire itself, fell apart and was destroyed. The Pope continued to rule from Rome, so it's a different kind of, not an empire, but a power, uh, but ruling kind of separately. There's no empire. But the Byzantine Empire on the east from Constantinople continued to rule until 15, 1453, rather, B.C., or A.D., excuse me. 1453 AD. During this time period, however, there was 400 years without a Western Roman Empire. Then the Pope of Rome commissioned the creation of a Holy Roman Empire in the East. Again, not to attack or anything, but just to reconstitute a part of the empire that fell apart. So he starts this in 800 AD, more or less, around 800 with Charlemagne, and it goes from uh, from Charlemagne through the Franks and on up to, to the Germans, the capitals move. So the capitals move up and we get up to Germany, basically ruling the Holy Roman Empire. It's recognized as the Holy Roman Empire, which you might want to argue is not really the Roman Empire, but of the power that rules from Rome, Italy, created an empire that's really a Roman Empire. I mean, there's really no way around that. Well, that continues up into the 1800s when it begins to fizzle and then begins to come back. So at this point, 14, uh, 1453 AD, the Byzantine Empire falls to the Ottomans, the Ottoman Empire, the Turks. Now, the religion then would change from being Christian to Muslim. But in a sense, it's still a ruling empire from Constantinople. Nothing has really changed. Remember in the beginning, Rome was pagan, then it became Christian, and now it's become Muslim, so to speak. Uh, religions change, empires, dynasties change, but empires kind of stay the same. So Germany is uh, fizzling out in the late 1800s with Napoleon Bonaparte. So what's going to happen is eventually Germany tries to reunite, recreate the empire, and that causes what we know to be World War I. And so at the end of World War I, the empire was not reconstituted, uh, but the uh, Ottoman Empire that sided with Germany to try to reconstitute this whole thing was broken up by the Allied forces. So no matter how you look at it, 1917 was kind of the end of the empire, but then uh, 20, 30 years goes by, and we all know Adolf Hitler rises to power in Germany. And of course, what they want to try to do is recreate the empire. That lasts about seven years, and it causes World War II, the end of which is the empire is completely shattered. Germany is split in half, and everything supposedly is fixed. The Ottoman Empire is gone. All this is gone. So it still tends to be broken up like that. So that's why down here we have AD 1945 as the end of the empires, as far as the two legs are concerned. Now what's going to happen is somehow the parts of this empire, the, the iron parts, are going to mix with the aluminum or clay parts and form an empire of two feet, like two arms, like two legs. And then eventually out of that is going to come 10 toes, a confederated system of 10 nations coming together to form an empire. And in the days of the toes, those 10 kingdoms, that's when the second coming of Jesus Christ occurs. And that is the basic prophecy. So what we need to figure out is these things. This all helps us. I mean, gold, silver, copper, and in a sense, 
iron is all gone. But when you begin to understand the Roman Empire didn't fizzle out in 1453 or 476, 1945, very important. Some people might say 1917, but there are another prophecy, other prophecies, one specific I'm thinking of in a scroll that dates the time periods, the, the um, not by day or hour, but by um, um, capitals when the empire moves from here to here. And if you look at that prophecy, it has to be uh, World War II we're talking about, so 1945. So very, very important. So at this point, we'll stop with this, because this is, if you haven't ever went through this before, this is a major, major thing to wrap your head around. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that says, starting with him, there's going to be these empires that's going to end in a messianic kingdom. Okay, and so um, a lot of people say it's the church, but it can't be because of the division of the Roman Empire and the continuation of oh, this whole thing is not over before Rome becomes Christian. That happens way back here. So we're talking about a Protestant pre-tribulational uh, premillennial view of prophecy. So very, very important. And the scrolls and the church fathers have the same exact view. So basically for us to know that it's Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome ends in 1945, most likely. Unless, of course, it hasn't. Again, I could see you thinking 1917, but then there was Hitler in World War II. So depending on how the rest of the prophecies play out, it may actually not be completely over yet. Uh, whatever happens is going to happen quickly because there's not that much time left. But we want to look at these things going forward and see many of these other things. There's a, several other prophecies for this particular time period. So we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight. And, okay, I'm just giving a little bit of time there so I can... Now we'll go to the chat room and see what's going on if there's any questions. And again, let me just stop for a second. Um, so what I'm trying to do, what I'm going to try to do going forward is to create these small snippets like this. That's a half an hour, so that's not super small, but that's the beginning of a new prophecy uh, playlist. And we will go through and look at these things piece by piece. We didn't look at the toes. We didn't look about uh, how their seed is mingled with the seed of men, what that might mean the time period, or there's several other details. Uh, but that basic stuff is what we want to look at. Now, when we go and look at the ram and the goat and several other things, we will begin to see other pieces come together, and we can pull one point together each time. That's what I would like to try to do. And also, we, um, in an effort to grow our community and funding and, and uh, subscribership, membership, things like that, we started doing a 24-7 live stream. And hopefully that's not confusing to anybody. According to what I keep reading and everybody keeps saying is anytime you're live streaming, YouTube takes the live stream and bumps it up to where more people notice it, much more than a uploaded video. So if we take our old stuff, uh, the best of our old stuff and continue to rebroadcast it, so to speak, will get noticed more. And it seems to be working. We have 100 new subscribers over the weekend, or the first weekend we tried this. We started it on um, Friday, and so now it's Monday. So we'll see what happens. Okay, um, let's see. First question. Is Tisha B'Av tomorrow? Let's uh, do something here. Let's look at our DSS calendar. And I'm always going by the, the DSS calendar date. So right now, this is, and again, this is Monday night, but in Israel, it's already Tuesday. So we're talking about uh, Tuesday, July 25th. Uh, Dead Sea Scroll date is um, the 5th. Um, and so the Pharisee date is the 7th, uh, if this is correct. So two days on the Pharisee date, 
uh, four days on the other date. So if we just come here and look at the 2023 calendar, and we would want to go to July, today's the 24th. Okay, here we go, 24th, which is here. So Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av, would be this coming Sunday. It's always on a, on a well, on this calendar, it's always on a Sunday. Anyway, uh, first fruits of new wine was last Sunday. And a lot of people get these confused. Some people teaching on the internet are getting first fruits of new wine and Pentecost confused. And based on this calendar, if there was any prophecies going to be fulfilled this year on one of those, they're both over. So back here is Pentecost. So that was June 4th this year on this calendar. And this time it's uh, first fruits of new wine is the third. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about the prophetic significance of this particular one because we don't have details or the rituals written down. We have the Passover Haggadah, so we understand Passover very, very well. Passover and first fruits and unleavened bread, rather. Um, but the other stuff we don't. We have some of the rituals that the Essenes did on Pentecost. So that helps of several little things. The rest of them we really don't have. And we, if we could ever get a hold of those rituals, we'd know exactly what those festivals teach. I'm pretty sure we would. So right now, the 9th of Av would be uh, the, this coming sa Sabbath or Saturday, rather, 9th of Av. And the reason why it's significant is because many, many bad things happen on the 9th of Av. And uh, I can't remember all of them, but there's like 15 or 20. Always bad things happening to Israel. So, for instance, when the spies came back and said the land of Canaan is great, but there's giants there, we're not going to go in. And God basically cursed them. They said, well, you're going to walk in the wilderness then for 40 years until your corpses drop. I mean, if you, I, I brought you this far and you don't think I'm going to take care of you. So that was extremely blasphemous. So that, that, that was supposed to be, according to tradition, on a ninth of Av. The uh, destruction of the first temple, the destruction of the second temple, were supposed to be on a ninth of Av. And Josephus would record some of those. The desecration of the temple by Antiochus Epiphanes was supposed to be on a ninth of Av. And then the, ex, the expulsion of the Jews from like Spain and Britain and Germany and uh, the recent centuries were all supposed to be on a Tisha B'Av or a ninth of Av. And again, those are kind of hard to tell. On the Jewish calendar, modern Jewish calendar, sometimes they're identical. Other times they're up to like two or three days off. So it just kind of all depends. And then many times it's like, well, World War I, there is no official date on when World War I started. It's kind of in this area, but it depends on if you say it's when a certain person got shot or when a certain army first marched or the year you know, the starts, of course, and World War II started in 38, but to pinpoint an exact date is usually kind of hard. You can always pinpoint the end when the enemy surrenders. So that's the official end of something. And anyway, so there's lots of stuff like that. So if we're broadcasting here on Monday, this coming Sunday is Tisha B'Av. So if anything bad is supposed to happen to Israel uh, this year on a Tisha B'Av, it will be next, uh, well, Saturday, rather, excuse me. And that, of course, is Friday night and Saturday. So the next Sabbath. So something to be praying about. Most of the time, I, like I say, 15 or 20 things that happen, that's definitely a pattern. But it's not that something happens every year. So, But we have the uh, appending possible war. I shouldn't even say possible because according to prophecy, it happens. There's a war between Israel and Iran mentioned not only in the Bible, in Jeremiah, but also in Enoch and a few other places. And then there's the the several prophecies about Damascus, not just Psalm 17, but there's several others in some of the scrolls. And then the other things that happen, like we just started tonight talking about the revival of the empire and the toes. And there are several small prophecies about how those develop and who does what. Not, a, not enough to really paint a complete picture. But if you take all the prophecies from the Bible, and the prophecies from the scrolls, 
and you listen to how the church fathers interpret them, church fathers could be wrong because they're not prophets. They're just pulling stuff together. But the church fathers are people that knew the apostles, that had access to only not only the Old Testament, but the school of the prophets in their writings. So you can think of us finally getting the Dead Sea Scrolls, pulling it together with that. And if I could run and check with John or Peter and see what they thought, that would be cool. So that's why we look at an early church father. And sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they have different opinions. But for the vast majority, we want to at least look at them. So anyway, uh, you can always come here, dsscalendar.org. And you, it's linked off of our main website, biblefacts.org. So, okay, next question. I was reading Gad the Seer, and in chapter one, it describes the two oxen led by a donkey to the north and a camel to the south, causing four mixtures to betray a righteous doer. What does it mean, the four mixtures? Um, it describes it as a way of, and it might be two or three different things, but it basically describes it as a way of how iniquity forms. So basically, it starts off saying that this is right and this is wrong. So it's down here. And then somehow in society, they say, well, yeah, this is right and it's the best way. And this is not really wrong. It's just a different way. It's not as good as this one, but beggars can't be choosers. So it's, you know, moved up the scale a little bit. And then the third way, it ends up saying, no, it's they're, they're both OK, but this is actually better than the other one. And then in the fourth one, they say that evil is actually good. And we don't know why you're saying that didn't used to be. It's always been, you know, so it's it's that kind of a thing. And evil always has that. And when you look at society, you always have these weird changes. We've always been a Christian nation. Certain things have always been wrong. Then they were tolerated. Then they were on par. It's just, I'm not a Christian, therefore I do things differently. No, it doesn't matter. You can be you, I can be me, everything's fine. Now we're getting to that last stage where people are saying, I don't know where you got this idea we were a Christian nation. I mean, as far as I know, we've always been like this. Number one, they can't write cursive. They can't read history. <laughs> They've never studied history in school. Naturally, they wouldn't know anything like that. But if you read any of the histories, it's very, very clear. So that's kind of what we're talking about. So in this particular chapter, there's a donkey and a um, camel in this. And the interesting thing about it is this goes back to the Roman Empire a little bit. There are two separate um, powers, if you want to call them that. Sometimes it can be political, sometimes religious, sometimes both. But there are these two pieces of darkness that are leading uh, Israel and Judah astray. And throughout that whole prophecy, it's basically talking about um, these two powers exist. The Messiah comes and halfway fixes it at his first coming when he creates the redeemed. And then he goes back to being with the father. And then he comes back and finishes the problem and sets up a kingdom. And so these two things have existed all the way through. They exist during his first coming and they exist during his second coming all the way through. So you've got some sort of a weird religious thing in the south and its symbol is a crescent moon. And there's another anti-Semitic power. It says in, in chapter two, it describes these as being headquartered in Rome, Italy. So we understand something from Islam and something from Roman Catholicism, not necessarily the entire thing of each, but a faction of them or something come together to form what is called a harlot or a mystery religion, um, which is a false religious system. Now, today, if the rapture is really close and everything's getting ready to come, it would almost have to be Chrislam. Now, I don't know what's going to happen with Chrislam. If that's going to fizzle out in something else, but it's something along those lines as prophesied. And some people, it, it's interesting, some people have said, well, Islam, though, didn't start until Muhammad about five or 600 AD. So that's way past the Messiah's first coming. And they were here during that time period of the first coming. Well, Rome definitely was as a power. 
not Roman Catholicism yet, because there is no Christian anything yet, but Rome was a power. And we do have uh, an Allah symbolized by a moon, a moon god at the Kaaba, where they had their, their 300 and some odd gods before Muhammad. So there's a whole lot of connections like that. So we're not saying Rome as far as like the old Roman Empire that you think of or the pagans of Arabia, or the Muslims per se, or the Roman Catholics, or this or that. But there's always been a group of people somewhere, uh, and it's like this in Christianity. There's Christians, and then there's Christian cults. There's always been Christians since Christians Christianity started, and there's always been cults, starting with the Gnostics and going forward. So... It's interesting to look at these things, but somehow these things pull together. And when you're in the middle of everything, the prophecy should be pretty self-explanatory. And we're just now beginning to understand them. When we continue looking closely at the scriptures and the scrolls, and then throw in little comments from the church fathers, I think we'll get a lot further. But that's basically the mixtures. And it's, it's interesting to see because that's going to happen more and more. Can you please explain Daniel 7.7 7 and 7.19? Let's do that. So Daniel 7, 7 says, After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke into pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. This is talking specifically about the Roman Empire. The beasts in Daniel, and we'll get to this in a later study, but the beasts in Daniel 7 correspond to the metal empires in the image in Daniel 2. So we're starting off with a winged lion, which is Babylon, and then we have a, a uh, bear, which is Medio Persia, which is like the silver, and then we have uh, a leopard, which is Greece. And in here, we're going to see that the, the leopard actually splits into four heads with four wings. And that's what happens with Alexander the Great. I was telling you, there's four kingdoms, and then two have something to do with Israel until Rome shows up. So, and then this one is the fourth one, which corresponds to the iron legs. And as, as you see here, it has iron teeth. So, each one of these has some sort of a dominion. This one is the longest lasting because it starts in 64 BC and goes to at least 1945 AD. Um, but then other th it's not completely over because we have the empire of the feet, which turn into the empire of the toes. So very, very important. And then your other one was 719. It says, I would like to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from the others exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, its nails of brass, which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with its feet. So anyway, this is talking specifically about uh, Rome again. If you're wondering about the nails of iron or teeth of iron and the nails of brass, that actually might be in there. The Dead Sea Scroll version of Daniel is identical with what we have except in this one verse, verse 19, this part here about the and the nails of brass is not there. In the Dead Sea Scroll version, it says the teeth and nails were of iron, which actually makes more sense to me. But this might be correct. If it's correct, it's got something to do with the Greek Empire. There's some difference between the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire, other than just size. There's some technical difference. And somehow those two come together in this beast somewhere along the line. Um, let's see. And so this beast has 10 horns on its head, whereas the statue has the feet that has the 10 toes. So the 10 toes, the 10 horns are these 10 kingdoms. So the more you study prophecy, the more you see other symbols showing the same thing. And when we go through this, we'll see Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And there will be pieces in here that are so obvious that it has to be what it is. And then in Daniel, we're told those empires came in that order. So when you compare those together, it makes sense. And then when we throw in the Testament of Noah about the empires, he gives us a few more clues that 
neither one of those have. And then when we throw in Revelation, we get a few more clues and we just keep building on this. But we need to get our basis right first. If we thought this was amillennial, for instance, we would be way off. We wouldn't be able to understand anything. So we have to understand there's a premillennial view on this. The Messiah comes and sets up a kingdom sometime in the future. That's just basic premillennialism. Right before that, there's a seven-year period. We'll, we'll study that. That's in Daniel chapter 9. But very, very clear, a seven-year period. No more, no less. And it, it ends with the second coming. So it's all right there as one series of events in a short tier, time period. And then there's an Antichrist. And we learn some other things about him and the wars and stuff. But it all fits in with this. So the Antichrist time is when the time of those 10 nations are around. So right after they're created, right before they create an empire. But it's at the end of the feet part, beginning of the toes part. So hopefully that, that explains a few things. And there's a lot of things I don't know, but we're still trying to pull them together. Uh, Nehemiah 2.1 says the decree to rebuild was given in Nisan. Your ancient prophecies book says it was given March 14th, 444, and end exactly on May 14th, 1948. But isn't March 14th always in Adar? Uh, I'd have to go back and look that up. That uh, I got that from Chuck Misler. That's strange. Um, Chuck Misler and several other guys had given those dates. So we need to do a study specifically on that, go back and look at the fine points of that, find out for sure, do the calculations. I've done that before in a couple of videos, but um, sometimes they're blurry. And then um, other times, March 14th, uh, some texts say 444, some say 445. It, it, it you know depends on when it ends. Uh, but with the Dead Sea Scrolls telling us exactly when it ended, we can actually replicate it back that way. So um, I agree and believe with what Chuck Smithler said and Grant Jeffrey and several of the other guys. They did the hard work of figuring it out. And I did the easy work of saying, hey, there's a scroll that agrees with that. So we can kind of backtrack it. So, yeah, it's uh, sometimes it's very difficult to do that. I don't know why. It's just I know it's difficult for me, but somehow numbers just get garbled. But the interesting thing about that is no matter how you do it, it's give or take a year. And I think that's interesting how everybody talks, not just the prophecies, but the history in general. I still go to history books and look up the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. And inevitably, they almost always say it's 69 or 70 AD. Well, which was it? 69 or 70? It shouldn't be that hard to figure. It was on a ninth of off. It shouldn't be that hard to figure out. Well, give or take a year. So it's kind of difficult. We have the same problems with um, different manuscripts and historical things with uh, trying to date Jesus' birth. Because they try to date it with uh, when Quintinius was ruler. Or they try to date it with Herod ruling. And then there's a couple of different manuscripts that have Herod ruling at slightly different times. And so it's it's difficult to put together. But that's a good question. Thank you. I didn't really answer it, but we'll have to do that. See if we can get any further on it. Also, what is the historical record that says it was given on March 14th? Is it really, it's really an awesome prophecy and I'd like to know the start date, what it's based on. Okay, we'll definitely get to that then. <clears throat> what is your opinion of uh, the prophecy about Russia, Crimea reaching the shores of Istanbul and Russia reaching the story? Um, I don't know anything about it, really. I'd have to take a look at it. And it um, seems like I remember something like that. But basically, from the scroll standpoint, there's this prophecy of a three-headed eagle and definitely goes, talks about Istanbul and Russia being a part of the Roman Empire at a certain point. Of course, you've got the Ottoman Empire, then you've got the Holy Roman Empire and all the other things. So it's pretty interesting to pull together. I'll have to do some research on that, though. As a matter of fact, let me take a second and pull up a Word document here. 
and I will write it down. And if I cannot mess up my, should have one of those open all the time. Okay, so it's V I L N A V A O N. Okay, I'll look that up and see what I can find out. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. Question, is there a correlation between the new moon and the rapture? I don't think there is one. And I think it's, um, or there might be, but it's not actually a new moon. The uh, modern Jewish calendar is a lunar one. And we're told by the rabbis that a Kodesh is a new moon. Okay. If the calendar is a lunar one, then a new moon is a new month. So it's the same thing. So it doesn't really matter. But with the Dead Sea Scrolls coming out saying we had a solar calendar to begin with, the lunar calendar is a perversion of it, as and it was prophesied to occur somewhere around 200 BC, and apparently did. Um, so with that in mind, if you wanted to say new moon, there's a different way of saying it. And I forget what the word for moon is. I don't know why I always forget that. But a Kodesh it literally means a new month. So even if you try to, you know, like go over to where Paul says, don't let anybody judge you to the Sabbath, the new moon festival, the festivals and the new moons and the Sabbaths. And those are a shadow of things to come, but the substances of Christ. If you look that up, even in Greek, totally different phrases, but you'll see that the literal is new month or beginning month, beginning of a month, a new first day of the month. And again, if it's a, a lunar calendar, it'd be the same. But if it's not, it's different. And nowhere would it ever say a new moon and use actual, the word for moon. It always uses the word for month. So there's no problem in scripture. There's no tampering of scripture that's happened. It's just our understanding. And I, we see that a lot today. And I've been through this before. I want to go back and learn the festivals. I want to go back and learn the Jewish traditions. And those are very, very helpful. But we got to remember that half that information comes from the Talmud. And since we're talking about the Talmud, we're talking about the Jews that rejected the Messiah that put together the history. And that's mainly just basic history, which is fine. But some things may not be 100% accurate. So we got to be careful with that in general. Okay, next question. On this Tisha B'Av, 9th of Av, on what day does it land on in the Dead Sea Scroll calendar? If anything happens on the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, Tisha B'Av, that should confirm the true calendar. Yeah, definitely. Um, according to, and we, we just looked at that, but let's look at it again, Dead Sea Scroll calendar. Um, actually, let me back up to here. Uh, so this is off five and Tuesday is off five. Okay. So uh, on the dead, the uh, modern Jewish calendar. So today is supposed to be, um, oh, let's, let me look this up again. Off seven. Okay. So two days. So that would put it the, right here or right here rather. So on the dead, on the modern Jewish calendar, it looks like it's Wednesday. On the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, Tisha B'Av is always on a Sunday, and of course it would be the 9th. So if something major happens on the 6th or on the 9th, or, you know, we have that leap week. Maybe we're doing the leap week in the wrong spot. So in that case, if something happened last Saturday, which I don't think anything did, or if something happens a week from this Saturday, it might indicate that this calendar is correct, but my leap week is off. So just something to think about. And that's a good idea to start looking. And if something happens, can that help us prove or disprove a calendar? And uh, please do. Don't don't think that I'm going to get mad or anything. Um, we're trying to put this together. I didn't invent it. So <laughs> we're just trying to get it correct. So if we can do a few things like that and certain prophecies come to pass on the dates they're supposed to, but it's always a week off, that would be cool. That just means my leap week is off somehow. So that's something to do. So again, dsscalendar.org, and you can come here and look. So their Tisha B'Av, 9th of Av, is Friday night and Saturday. Is there a correlation between the 9th of Av and the rapture and the new wine 
new wine or Pentecost. Um, there might be. Um, we're basically trying to put where the rapture might be. I will always thought Rosh Hashanah uh, Festival of Trumpets would be a good candidate for the rapture. But according to the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, you've got, you mentioned several of them here. Here's Pentecost. That was the 15th of Sivan, which this year anyway, was June 4th. And then you've got um, Feast of New Wine, which was last Sunday, the 3rd of Av, which is July 23rd. And then you've got the 9th of Av, which is next Sunday, the July 29th. And then the other one you mentioned, uh, okay, New Wine was here in Pentecost, yeah. So those are different dates. Um, and again, we don't have anything. We, we have the uh, Passover Seder, the, the uh, Seder Haggah. Uh, so the, the Passover Haggadah, rather. Um, and that gives us all the details of the Passover Seder ritual. And you can see in that the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah and several other things. So very, very clear. And Jesus did die on Passover. So we have a few things for Pentecost in the Damascus Covenant community rule and those things. But we don't have any kind of ritual details. We know from Scripture they did rituals on those things. We know a couple pieces to it nothing that would tell us anything um, specific. For instance, new wine, the only thing we really know about is um, on that date, there was a uh, tradition that normally you have to have your mother and father's permission and your, your fiance's mother and father's permission to get married, have a ketubah. It all has to be above board or it's considered kidnapping, stealing, what we would call statutory rape, you have to have permission or you cannot get married, period. But there's a tradition that started somewhere back then on the first fruits of new wine, the one day of the year you could elope without permission. And that, I, I think it started with, with things with like, uh, if, you, if one of the parents is dead or missing, you can't get married if you can't get a legal document permission. So what do you do? Well, on this one day of the year, if your parents are, are have disappeared, you know, then you could do something like that. But this is connected and, and real briefly mentioned in um, uh, where they had the war with Benjamin. Benjamin uh, basically almost got annihilated and they made uh, an oath that they would not allow their daughters to marry Benjamites. And then they realized that that was a mistake because if they do that, the, the tribe of Benjamin will simply cease to exist. So what do you do? You've already made a covenant. You've already sworn an oath that you will not allow your daughters to marry that group. What do you do? Well, you wait till festival of new wine and then don't look so hard. Don't guard anything. Let them come and take their girlfriends and get married. So it's an interesting thing. So we've got a few things like that. So that connects the festival of new wine with marriages, uh, marriages that aren't, aren't actually supposed to be kind of. So you can think about the bride of Christ righteously marrying Messiah, who really shouldn't marry him because she's not, she is a sinner. I mean, we're, we're sinners. So you can kind of see the symbolism in that. Uh, new oil is more of a prophetic thing. It's connected with... Uh, um, Zachariah's prophecy about the um, the two lamp stands. Uh, they're, they're called sons of new oil in that chapter. So there's a lot of things like that, but there's not enough detail to really say this is connected with, you know, the rapture or the bride of Christ or the return or the marriage supper of the lamb or whatever. So it would be nice if we found something specific. Happy to find the question and answer section. Do you think the continuation of the Roman Empire, both sides of the coin, could be seen in the relationship to the mystery Babylon of mysticism? Yeah, it's got to fit in there somewhere. Um, and again, the mystery Babylon thing, if, if we plug Gad into it, we haven't looked at that yet, but it seems to indicate part of Roman Catholicism, part of Islam, or maybe all of both, whatever, uh, come together to form a type of Chrislam. That seems to be 
an indication of mystery Babylon. And that's not an empire at all, but the new empire, once it forms like the 10 nations, will probably have some sort of a religious thing, you know, and that could be something along the lines of um, uh, agnosticism, secularism, everybody has some sort of religion or Islam or Roman Catholicism or whatever. So we'll have to see what happens. Uh, so it's definitely in a relationship there somehow. We got lots of questions tonight. Some are saying that the ninth of all will be the rapture of the church because we are the temple of God on earth now. And it would affect the Jew. It would affect the Jews or something. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, since it's the time that they're always slaughtered, I kind of hope not. Uh, a rapture would be a good thing. It would be like the kingdom coming and everything. Ninth of Av has always been something very, very bad because you did something you, you weren't supposed to do, like rejecting God's decrees like the spies. So you now get, um, uh, you now get, uh, no, you don't get the blessing. It would almost be like, you did something and you don't get raptured because Ninth of Av took place, something along those lines. So I don't see that as being connected to the church itself. But um, we'll see. I mean, there, there might be something to it. I would think if something happens like this Ninth of Av, it's something more like a war with Israel and it ends badly. You know, as far as, far as Israel is concerned, if there's a war and they win it and everything's fine. That would be one thing, but it's always something to, to uh, almost hold your breath and see what happens if anything happens. That nothing happened last year that I remember. I mean, there's always skirmishes and stuff, but nothing you know big actually happened. But that's a good question. I'm glad you did make it in the chat room. Ten nations or ten divisions? Any ideas? Well, the church fathers seem to indicate ten nations. Uh, Hippolytus mentioned in Daniel 11 that when the Antichrist, who's the king of the north, comes down and attacks Egypt, he's the king of, and we're, we're not told exactly, but like Syria, somewhere up there, but he comes down to attack Egypt. And when he does that, because Egypt doesn't like him somehow, that's pretty straightforward and understood in Daniel 11. But there's a passage that says that Libya and Cush... Um, come to aid uh, Egypt and are against at, at the Antichrist heels, but he ends up destroying them. Uh, so in other words, uh, then Hippolytus says that that means, and that's just his opinion, but he thinks that means that Egypt, Libya, and uh, probably Sudan, uh, whatever those three are now, um, are the three nations of the 10 that rebel against the Antichrist very good guess i don't I mean, he doesn't say that he learned that directly from john or anything like that or under the apostles so don't know for sure i know there is an idea of taking the world the entire globe and dividing it into 10 pieces so we'll have to see if that actually happens or not so it's always something to watch for i mean most likely it's 10 nations uh but not necessarily so a good question. Have you ever heard of uh, Joy? P yes. I don't know anything about her, though. She believes Prince William is the Antichrist and that he was cloned from the blood on the shroud. Interesting. She's a popular author, as it would seem. Well, the uh, Antichrist is supposed to be a king from a country north of Israel. It's not exactly identified for sure as being, you know, Turkey or um, Syria or Iraq or Lebanon, but it's somewhere in that neighborhood. And maybe it'll be all together by that time. But Prince William is a prince of England. So there's no way that England is north of Israel. So that doesn't fit. Now, somebody could have been cloned. That would be kind of interesting. I've heard that kind of a theory before, uh, cloning or genetic tampering, that kind of stuff. So um, I would not believe that Prince William would have anything to do with that. He might not be a good guy. I don't know. But um, he doesn't qualify as being the king of a country north of Israel. Now, if something was to happen 
and he was to leave England and somehow become the king of Turkey or Syria or Iraq or something like that. He's not Muslim, so I kind of doubt it, but you never know. Or Jordan. Well, Jordan's east. But anyway, uh, something like that. You know, there's always a possibility. But right now, he doesn't qualify. Do you think that Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 is about a saved person leaving Christianity, becoming like unsaved, or a Christian who had the gifts of the Spirit, then became corrupt, maybe taking money for healing, etc.? Um, a lot of us believe you can lose your salvation, and a lot of us believe you can't. And I've always been on the side of you can lose your salvation. Uh, but I'm kind of neutral these days because of other things. That's one particular verse that always made me wonder. I mean, that's the one that sounds like you're losing your salvation. And I ask all my friends that believe in eternal security, how do you interpret this? And I get the, eh, which always bothered me. I mean, that it doesn't mean anything, but, you know, that's the one everyone's going to hit you with. But when I was reading the scrolls, and looking at the whole concept of the reason why Hebrews would have been written. The whole idea is that Paul is saying, basically, Paul is writing to the Jews that not the Jews, but the, the temple priests. OK, and basically saying, look, in a nutshell, this is this is Hebrews. Um, there's Pharisees, there's Sadducees, there's Essenes and there's other groups. They all teach different things with prophecy. Um, and you can be any one of them. And I can understand you thinking this makes more sense to me than that one. So I'm going to be one of these. That's fine. But when Messiah comes and you have been made a partaker in the kingdom to come by seeing the works, you've had people that you know, your family members that were born blind, that now read books. You were there when a loved one died. You buried them. Now they're up walking around. I mean, obviously Messiah came. There's no way around this. Okay. So does that fit with the Sadducees or the Pharisees? No. It does fit with the Essenes. Does it fit with anybody else? No. Well, then why don't you leave your denomination and become an Essene? You know, it's just like these denominations that are, uh, Israel has nothing to do with God. You know, replacement theology. Well, how in the world did they go back into the land of Israel and declare themselves a nation started up on the exact day prophesied? How is that even possible? Not to mention the reestablishment of the, the language and just all the other prophecies. Well, if they're symbolic of something else, how did they actually do it literally? You know, and there's even some people that would actually say, I don't know, but if it is, our denominations teachings are wrong and I'm not going there. It just can't be, you know, and then they kind of walk away from it. That's spooky. But Paul is basically saying, if you guys were there, you witnessed it, you experienced it. Some of you were healed. Some of your loved ones were raised from the dead. You know what you saw. Okay. So if there's a series of prophecies and you saw him die on the cross and then he's up walking around the next day or three days later. And you saw all this stuff. You were there. You were made a partaker in the heavenly things. Now you're going to reject the offering of the Messiah. There's no more hope for you. And so basically that's it. So in other words, he's saying if and, and if that's true, within 15 years, the temple is going to be destroyed. Because he's writing this around 58, 59, something like that. So in the, within 15 years, and it was like, you know, 11 or something, the temple's going to be destroyed. So if you're going to be obstinate and say, I'm going to continue doing the law of Moses, I'm going to reject this Messiah, even though I know what I saw, you know, if those prophecies took place, the, the other ones will. There's going to be fire. There's going to be destruction. There's going to be massive, massive death. You just got a couple of years to get your theology straightened out and change denominations, and you best do it quick. And that's basically Hebrews to those Jewish priests. I mean, think about this. And that's why it's confusing to us, because we look at that and think, well, how could I? The only way that would have anything to do with me is I must lose my salvation. 
because I was made a partaker, tasted of the heavenly gift, been made a partaker in the world to come, and now I walk away from it. And you think like, well, he just never got saved. Well, how could you be made a partaker in the Holy Spirit and not be saved? Well, one and only way, and that's in that situation. So, and I think that's really what he's talking about. So with that in mind, it doesn't really apply to losing your salvation or not losing your salvation. So that that's one of the interesting things about that. But I think it's specifically talking about that. So if you're doubting, maybe you grow up in a, in a denomination and you say, I believe in Jesus, but I don't like those wacky charismatics or I don't like those Baptists or I don't like this. And then you go somewhere because the gifts don't happen anymore. And you see people healed. I mean, not the funny stuff, but your relatives and you know, and you witnessed it and you walk away from that. There's no excuse. So, and I think that's really what we're talking about there. It's a good question. I struggled with that for a long, long time trying to figure that part out. And it's just the only thing I could come up with is they lost their salvation. I don't know how else to explain it. So, do you think Revelation unfolds chronology, ugh, excuse me, in order, chronologically, or the events are stacked on top of each other, occurring simultaneously? I think they're they're chronological, um, and I could be wrong. The, the pieces in the middle are telling you this is how, this is what the, the woman clothed in the sun is, and this is what the seven-headed dragon is. And to understand it, you have to understand the stuff way back when. So it's not saying that this occurred way back when, but that's how this got started. So there's there's these little chapters. And obviously, no matter how you do it, um, like seal number four has to be after seal number one. It can't be the other way around or they wouldn't be numbered like that. Some people take it. There's an early church father that says that they're stacked up like that. That's up in the third century, and he's got some interesting points, but I, it's uh, highly fragmented, so I kind of wonder about it. And I don't think there's enough church fathers to really, outside of that, that late commentary, early church fathers, to say one way or the other. But my opinion is that it's chronological. Do you think the seven thunders mentioned in Revelation could be seven more judgments? I'm not really sure what those are. Um, some of the theories are that they tell us exactly when things happen, and that's why they were sealed up and not mentioned. Um, so I'm not sure about that one. If you find out, let me know. Uh, the ancient book of Enoch 74 seems to say that all the years are exactly 364 days long for eternity, not a single day more or less. What do you think about that in regard to a leap week? Um, yeah, I think it's, I don't think there's a problem with it. I think we have um, a 365 day year on our Gregorian calendar and once every, once every, um, uh, four years, we have an extra day, but nobody ever really writes it as this year. It's a 366 day year. I mean, it is, but nobody ever writes it like that. <clears throat> and I think it's just how it's written. I'm thinking what this is saying, whether it's right or wrong. And, and also remember Enoch gives us a lot of clues, but the full version is from the Ethiopic. And so the numbers can be off a lot as far as like dates and you know, stacking things up. But in this case, uh, I think it's saying that all the years are 364. So I think their way of looking at it is starting from creation. It's been 364 all along. It's never been a 360 or a 354 or anything like that. Um, so that it hasn't changed. I think that's what it's saying. So yeah, if we have a 364 day, uh, uh, that was a big debate a few years ago when we were trying to put the calendar together. If it's a 364-day year, period, forever and ever, eventually spring will, will shift back into fall and winter and, and go on like that. And the main whole point for the calendar is that it's centered on the equinoxes and the solstices. 
So there's got to be some sort of a leap something in there. And it can't be, uh, you know, like one day every year or something like that, because there are calendars, there are full calendars in the Dead Sea Scrolls that don't have, and they actually have moon calculations in them like we do on ours. This day, Tuesday is a full moon and two days later, it's whatever. So you can see putting the, the lunar calculations on the calendar, you can see that there's no skips. There's no extra days every single year. And then what you'll notice is that there's one calendar that's exactly five years. And then it starts a new, there's one or two years in a new cycle, starts over. Then there's another calendar that's got six years. And then the cycle starts over. So looking at those, if you know there's no leap day every or one or two every single year to keep it straight, and they go for a full pattern of either five or six years, the five or six year patterns would fit with a leap week. And since it's not lunar, there's no uh, month to go by. So the evidence, we don't have anything to actually tell us that this is how you do it. But the evidence just looking at their old calendars is that there's a leap week. So the only question in my mind is like, I have the leap week on this calendar, but did I put it in the right spot? Is it this year or last year? You know, that kind of thing. And there's still some debate on that. But I think that's basically what it's saying in Enoch. One of these days, I'd love to get a full Hebrew or Aramaic version of Enoch and just see kind of how, how it works. Without a leap week, the seasons would evenly occur, would eventually occur in different months of the year. Is there any mention of the Bible or D Dead Sea Scrolls that the seasons must always occur in the same months? Uh, no, but the seasons always occur when they do. Well, actually, yeah, I would say that. According to the calendar, that's like when, and there are, like I said, there's two different calendars in there that are full calendars going up five years and six years and then starting over. And so they always have that. Uh, the uh, Tekufa is always on the Tuesday, and this is the first day of the year. But this will drift back one, two, three. And then when we go four, it'll actually be a different week. So that's when you would add a leap week, and it would start here. Then three years later, it'd be one, two. It'd be back to where it's supposed to be. So every five or six years, there's a leap week, and that keeps keeps um, the start of the year always in this week. So it's fascinating. Once you get used to it, it's pretty simple and really ingenious. Um, but it is really confusing. I remember when I first started studying the modern Jewish calendar with the lunar stuff. It was really confusing. How did all the different rules and stuff. What do you think is the hook in the jaw? that will lead the king of the north towards Israel to take booty in Ezekiel. Oil reserves now found near Megiddo, technology, intel, or what would be leading to the war? Um, I'm not exactly sure. A lot of people think it's probably oil because they got the natural gas now, but you, I don't think you ever have natural gas without oil. So it's there somewhere. You just have to find it. But the natural gas in and of itself can be very important, especially if anything happens to Russia or if Russia just decides to shut off the gas supplies. They do. I mean, Germany and a lot of those places have. So they would either have to start using Israel's or actually go to war or something. You can't turn people's gas off in the winter or t turn off their water. I mean, that's that's how wars start. So something like that happens. Technology, maybe. But to me, it seems more like uh, oil reserves. Well, we know what's happening now with um, the Ukraine uh, during a war like that. If they bomb enough of the uh, plants that produce the electricity and or gas, then the people basically freeze to death. And so it's, it's a really bad situation in that case. In your book, Fallen Angels, one of the classes of angels are that you listed are valiant ones. Could the stories of modern day history about valiant Thor be about a fallen valiant one? Perhaps. That's, uh, there are several things like that. The, the Talmud mentions, and I don't know if it names them all, but it mentions 10 classes. Now, we know from scripture there are seraphs, uh, seraphim, uh, cherubs, seraphs, cherubs, 
angels and archangels, which an archangel is probably just a ranking of an angel. So there's angels in general, and then seraphs and cherubs. Oh, and uh, Ophanim are mentioned in, well, in the Hebrew, it's usually translated wheels in King James, but there's Ophanim. So that's four different sets, valiant ones. And there's actually a uh, Devarim in the scrolls. So it's a whole other classification of angels. And I don't think they're mentioned in the Talmud either. So that was kind of really interesting. And if I understand right, the Debarim are specifically angels that minister to the Messiah. And that's interesting because remember when Jesus said, if I wanted to, I could call several legions of angels, probably his personal troops. Really interesting to think about that. But yeah, it could be. Question, is the Holy Spirit connected with wine or new wine? It seems to be in scripture, the, the symbolism, uh, wine or the Holy Spirit or new wine. And there's a question on exactly what that is. I mean, uh, new wine is when you take grape juice, put it in a vat so it begins the process of fermentation. Uh, it's not grape juice at all. Grape juice is grape juice. New wine is something that you don't want to drink. You know, it's like half done. You don't want to eat half cooked food, that kind of stuff. Uh, but eventually it ferments properly. And then sometimes they'll put spices in it to make it certain kinds and all. And then uh, then you have wine. Uh, and the Holy Spirit always seems to be connected with those things in some of the symbolism. Now, the festival of new wine, I mean, obviously is connected with prophecy somehow in my mind. But again, since we don't have any specific records, we don't know. The only thing I know about new wine is that it's on the third of Av, which, uh, which is interesting when Jesus went to the uh, wedding of Cana. It said it was on the third of the month. It's third of the month. It's obviously festival of new wine. And there's a wedding. Remember the weddings were traditional there because that's when you could elope. And so that became a traditional wedding deal. And of course, when he's there, they ran out of wine. So he decides to turn water into wine. Everybody there would know exactly what's going on. I have no clue because I don't know the symbolism. Um, but it's got something to do with the water parts of the purification in the temple. And that would be like part of the uh, Beit Hashuiva ceremony in the temple. But how that comes together, I'm not sure. But it is interesting. It, it almost has to be something connected with the prophecies. Acts 2.1, do you think this possibly could have been mistranslated Pentecost? Or should have been the 50th day instead. Uh, let me look it up real quick. I don't think. Let's see. Acts 2.1. Yeah, okay. So Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were one accord in one place. What I would do on cases like that is <clears throat> look at the Latin, the uh, Georgian, the North and South Coptic. Uh, the, uh, the Syriac, all of the translations that were done in the first and second century. And if some of those translate it differently, then maybe if they all translate it the same way, it would be the same. So this says Pentecost and my King James, okay, this says 50th day as implied. Of course, that's what Pentecost means, 50. So the 50th day. And let's see if we go to the Septuagint. Oh, yeah, not available. Um, let's see here. Pentecost. Okay, say that's Greek. I'm not thinking straight. Where's my... Um, do, 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 do. Okay, here's my Syriac, Pentecost. Um, I don't have any of the others up here. Okay, anyway, uh, but the way the scrolls teach it is that from first fruits, there's 50 days to the festival of new wheat. So there's new barley, new wheat, and then 50 days after new, which we, we call Pentecost. 50 days after that, there is new wine. And then 50 days after that, there's new oil. And then there is a week of wood offering. And then three days later begin the high holy days. So it's all kind of grouped together that way. So... Knowing that back then, I doubt they would be they would be saying 50 as for just one of the 50s because there's four 50s. And that wouldn't tell us anything. 
And the tradition is from the church fathers and, and everybody is that the, the Holy Spirit fell on Pentecost. The tradition from the other things is that Pentecost, and we could do a study on that because there's actually several little things, but uh, Pentecost is when the, the, um, uh, the agreements or the covenants are fulfilled. So theoretically, according to the text, Adam had a covenant with God that was started on a Pentecost. So was Noah, the Noahide law, which is like Genesis 9. Doesn't say it in Genesis, but the tradition is it was on a Pentecost. Um, the covenant with Abraham, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai was supposed to be on a Pentecost. It was definitely during that month for sure. And then the other thing was uh, our, you know, Acts chapter 2. And then according to the scroll interpretation of Daniel with the 1335, we can enter the kingdom covenant if you're alive. You make it if, like if you miss the rapture and you happen to live through that, you're a human being and you, you get into the millennial reign. Uh, you can enter the kingdom covenant on a Pentecost. And that's actually an idiom, the 1335 points to a Pentecost. So all that together, I'm, I would say it, it means Pentecost. I know there's some people that say since it says 50, it may not be Pentecost. It might be new wine or if you go another 50, new oil. And I suppose that's a possibility, but the text seems to indicate Pentecost to me. Doesn't it also say that the kings of the East will trouble him, the Antichrist? Probably China, Korea, India. It's interesting. Yeah, the, the kings of the East. Now, in my mind, just going through scriptures, I always think kings of the East would be Persia, which today is Iran. But if Iran has been somewhat obliterated, at least the coast anyway, it's Elam, not, not Persia proper. Iran today is Persia and Elam put together. And the prophecy in Jeremiah 49 is specifically about Elam. So I always think of that. But, I, you know, but yeah, there's some kings of the east that come against the Antichrist. Will Jesus come back seven years to the day from when the covenant is signed? Don't know for sure. It would seem like it. A seven, 364 day years or something like that. I'm not sure exactly how that would fit. I wouldn't worry about it too much. I mean, well, if we're here, I'd be trying to hide out. But at the same time, we get it like it's like my my leap week. If I'm long wrong on the leap week, it's not this Sunday. It's next Sunday. So it's give or take a week, you know, but something like that. But I would think if not exactly on our calendar, it would be exactly somehow because it seems like it because the tribulation is seven years, uh, an entire Shemitah. That's not necessarily mean it starts on an even Shemitah year could, which is something to look at, but it's at least seven years long and it ends with the second coming. So it's not seven and a half it makes a big deal of it being three and a half and three and a half so give or take a day or two anyway but i would think it would be right at seven years if works have nothing to do with salvation how could works cause someone to lose his salvation i wouldn't think it could um the people that believe that you can lose your salvation well i take that back um i've met people that good good believing christians that think they've lost their salvation and got it back and lost it and got it back and you know this kind of stuff and that always amazes me because in my mind whether you can lose it or not you can't lose it and get it and lose it and get it because that violates um paul in first john 5 i believe it is there is a way that you can know that you have eternal life okay so if i if i could throw it away that's me on purpose throwing it away but if I could accidentally stub my toe, cuss, maybe have a heart attack that second, never have a chance to repent, if that's a possibility, I don't know that I have eternal life. I would have to wait and see. And so that seems to violate what John says about you can know. And so if you can walk away, then you'd have to do it intentionally. It's not an accidental sin, you know. Like I've known people that have said, you know, if somebody was to commit suicide, they got to be in hell because they committed a sin. They can't repent because they killed themselves. So we're done, you know, and then other people have said 
but nobody in their right mind would kill themselves. Nobody. That's got to be a wacky chemical problem or a, somebody slipped them a drug or whatever. And in that case, God would not judge them that way. That goes against the way God is, you know. So, and you know, I've in Calvary Chapel, I've had people say yes and no that way. I remember Chuck Smith simply saying, you can't say that. I mean, even if you believe you can lose your salvation, you don't know the state of mind. You can't say that he is or is not in heaven. You don't know. It's, a, it's an odd situation. So we can't really judge people like that. But I would agree. I, I, think, uh, I don't think works have anything to do with salvation. I think it's pretty clear. It's by faith. There are works that you prove your salvation by. And that's not doing anything in particular. It's just if I believe the scriptures... Uh, like, for instance, I believe somewhere there will be a mark that you put on the hand and you can't buy or sell without it. And then somebody starts trying, and I believe the story of Genesis 6 about Nephilim technology changing DNA. So when a doctor says we have this new thing and it changes DNA or it, or it, a banker that says we've got this new idea, I know that's not it, but that's a step in that direction. So it makes me cringe. So if I'm reacting badly to anything like that, it's because I'm a believer. That's just, that's an example of a work. Not that I did anything, but you can tell by my actions, my thoughts, my speech, that I'm over here, not over there. So, yeah, I don't think it could cause you to lose your salvation. If you can, you'd have to deliberately walk away. And then the question remains, if you could, and you, you'd, you'd still have to be in your right mind. You'd have to know what you're doing, refuse, and walk away. But who in their right mind gives up eternal life? So, again, it's, there's a lot of different angles on this. The only thing we can, we can say is uh, you don't have to worry about accidentally losing your salvation. Because in um, one, one great example is... Um, I think it's Hebrews 13, 12 or 13. It says that uh, if you are chastised of God, it's because you're actually a son. If you say you're a Christian and you're walking in sin and you don't have a problem with it and God's not chastising you, you're not one of us. That's just pretty obvious by just looking at you. So you need to get saved. Uh, you might think you are, but you're not. Otherwise, you'd have that nagging feeling in you, which is the Holy Spirit saying you're not supposed to be doing this. But the fact that if we're his kids, he will chastise us. The only reason he chastises us is that we're walking in sin, right? So I can walk in sin and not lose my salvation, at least in the beginning, because the first step anyway is chastisement. So you don't have to worry about accidentally losing your salvation. I think that's really, really important for us to know. Do you think the Bible holds the answer to when the rapture is? I don't know for sure. Um, I always go back to the scripture that says no man knows the hour or the day. And I know some people believe that could be pointing to when the destruction of the temple occurred, which is definitely before the end of the age. And it was like three or four years before. Um, or it could be talking about the rapture. So even if we knew for sure the date of the second coming, which would give us the exact date of the signing of the covenant, the beginning of the seven years, even if we knew that, the rapture is sometime before that. So I'm not sure. I wouldn't think it'd be too far before, but I don't think we can really put a date on that. Now, saying that, if I find a scroll or a text or something that does put a date on it, I'm definitely going to let you guys know. Because again, I didn't write it. I'm just bringing these things up. So, and examples of that are like Jehovah Witnesses. When they set dates, all of, you know, of course, all those days are gone. They were wrong. Um, but there are written documents. So it's things to study. Super Chat, $5. Thank you very much. I want to thank everybody for um, supporting us in, in that way. We have... Uh, the super chats, and if you become a member, you get in the chat rooms and stuff during the live streams and, and all those things. I want to also mention that we have um, a way to support our ministry in uh, through Give, Send, Go. So it's a Christian ministry, and I'm really thankful that they exist. Uh, PayPal and other places have been 
um, have at least talked about not following Christian virtues. And if you get a little too political or whatever, they might refuse to pay you and things like that. We also want to pray, pray for our ministry too. support us if you would like to, but then also pray for give, send, go, because they have contracts now to, you know, you can't nullify a contract. It would just mess everything up. But their contracts are out in two or three years or five years or something like that. And there are um, feelings, not reports, but the way people talk, it's kind of a really good possibility that uh, some of those places are going to say, we're not going to do business with Give, Send, Go anymore because they're too Christian. And so we're going to like cut ties and stuff. So they're some of the rumors are that they might be working with Gab and a few other places that are specifically Christian that will do their own things. I mean, surely somewhere there's a group of Christians that are wealthy that, you know, don't give us any of your money, but just take your money and make a bank, right? And then start using <laughs> using your resources to make even more money, get get even richer by letting us use credit cards and support each other, you know? Surely there's got to be some way of doing that, you know, the banking industry. But we all know the mark is coming, but just one of those things. Anyway, so uh, uh, says, hi, everyone. Please pray for Abigail uh, cancer surgery today. Let's say a, a prayer for Father. We just ask for um, uh, whatever the certain kind of cancer is for Abigail, we ask that you touch her and heal her, make the surgery go well. Whatever the situation is behind that, Lord, we just ask for healing. And in most, most importantly, we ask for the family members, her and her family members that are surrounded that may not know you. Use this to make them stop and realize we're not going to be here forever. And things like that could happen at any time. And we all need to start thinking seriously about a relationship with God. We just ask these things in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So thank you for that. Definitely. Let's see here. Let me go back to our chat room. And oh, that thing didn't go away. Hold on. Let me get the QR code to go away. There. That way we can see stuff. Okay. What was it you heard what was it? Oh, I must be getting tired. Ken, was it you that I heard say that they purposely hid new wine and new oil and removed them from one of the calendars? Process, yeah, it might have been me. Uh, I, I believe that because you have, um, not that anyone necessarily tampered with the text or anything, but in Leviticus it talks about uh, Pentecost or um, Passover uh first fruits of new uh first fruits of the barley and then uh unleavened bread and then it talks about from the sabbath after that counting 50 days is the first the 50 days the 50 day count pentecost is the first uh fruits of the uh the wheat and then it doesn't say anything more about festivals per se with that but then you go to nehemiah and several other places and you see that they had festivals not just for the barley and the wheat, but also the oil and the or the olives and the grapes. Uh, so those are very, very important. And the wood offerings, the wood offerings at the end. So all those come together. So there's got to be something like that. So there's and, and what I was saying, though, is interesting, because if you follow the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, all of those first fruit festivals always fall on a Sunday. And it's really, really interesting because we have Sabbatarians that say we shouldn't be worshiping on Sunday. And there's a whole lot of evidence to point the other direction. Um, not that we even reject the Sabbath, but apparently sa Saturdays and Sundays kind of went together all the way through, apparently. But there's all these different things for that. But the thing is, if you forget about new wine and new oil, and you just focus on first fruits of the barley and first fruits of the, the wheat, then there's only one fifty set of Pentecost. So what's interesting about that is the uh, Pharisees say that it starts on the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath after Passover day. 
and this calendar would say it's the Sabbath after Passover week. So they're like one week forward, but it's still always on Sundays. The Sadducees came along and said it's not the it's the high Sabbath we're talking about, not the weekly Sabbath. So it's the day after Passover day. So it'd be like Thursday. Well, of course, theirs might rotate, but it's sometime during the week. And if you follow that Sadducee way, no matter how you do it, you've gotten rid of all the Sunday festivals. Just boom, just by doing that. And I don't know if it's just them trying to do something different or if they're deliberately trying to hide all of the Sunday festivals. You know, so if they're 50, if 50 days apart and they're all on a Sunday and then you move the first one to be a Wednesday or something, they'll all be on a Wednesday. So somebody did something like that somewhere along the line. So, again, not necessarily tampering with scriptures or anything, but something weird going on with that. That's for sure. OK, just got a couple more and then we'll go ahead and quit. Uh, would the rapture be considered a covenant? Ooh, it might. That's a good point. In which case, yeah, Passover, I mean, a rapture on a uh, Pentecost or something. Or maybe even new wine. Yeah, I can definitely see something like that. Uh, beings that we have, um, a Pentecost, whether it was actually Pentecost or one of the others, and we have Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection starting on Passover, and the rituals pointing to it, and the fall festivals pointing to, as, as far as we know, the fall festivals anyway, a rapture, resurrection, a seven-year period of Yamin Narim, and then a, um, a second coming, an Azazel goat, and a uh, tabernacle time. Since those teach the basic stuff that we can see, it makes sense that all of that stuff's prophetic. So the rapture, I would assume, would be on one of those, you know, because... It's not so much that they're Jews and we're Christians, but we're all believers. So in that sense, you know, it may or may not apply to us. So we don't know for sure, but definitely something to look at. I'm reading through Hosea. Can you help explain the spring and the water rains in verse 6, 2, and 3? Yeah, basically uh, in Israel, there are two rainy seasons. And those were used also as a... Um, um, a, a prophetic thing. James talks about it, Joel, and then Hosea, and I think it's in one other minor prophet. But it talks about the teacher of righteousness coming as the rains in the fall and in the, in the spring. So it's very clearly talking about two comings of one Messiah, one in the fall, one in the spring. And so his first coming, where he did what he came to do, which is die on Passover, is spring, and the fall festivals are talking about the second coming, which again would indicate it might be uh, in the fall when we have the rapture, resurrection, or something like that. Not necessarily, but it's a good indication. Pretty amazing how all that stuff comes together. At first, you're looking at that and saying it's just, you know, just spring rains, but it's really specific. The teacher of righteousness comes in the spring and the fall rains. Obviously, two comings there, but why would he come? What is the point of saying that except a prophetic one? Okay, last question for tonight. And let me uh, see here. Uh, are you familiar with Doug Woodward's Rebooting the Bible? Yes, he gave me a copy of that a year or so back. Well, there's volume one and volume two, but anyway, it's about the King James Version and the Pharisees messing up the text. What are your thoughts on it? Um, he goes by the Septuagint, and basically we have two types of Bibles. There's a Hebrew and there is a Septuagint. The Septuagint numbers are quite a bit different than the Hebrew. So, for instance, in a King James, for instance, it'll, it'll say uh, Seth was born when Adam was 130. And in the Septuagint, it says Seth was born when Adam was 230. So 100 years difference. And a lot of the verses are like that. The Dead Sea Scrolls, which I don't believe have been tampered with because they're extremely anti-Pharisee, anti-Sadducee, agree with the Masoretic text when it comes to the numbers. There's a few things in the Masoretic text that are different, like when Paul quotes a body you have prepared for me, and our Masoretic text says something totally different, 
Dead Sea Scroll version agrees with Paul. And every one of those cases, there's not many, there's maybe like four or five of those where Paul quotes the Old Testament, but he quotes it different than the way we have it today, uh, at least a little different. And every one of those cases that we have, the Dead Sea Scroll agrees with Paul. And sometimes the Septuagint does too. So there's a little bit of um, study to be done. We don't want to throw the Septuagint away just because it's got some numbers wrong. Uh, but based on the scrolls, who they say the different people were, and the other histories, I don't think it fits with a Septuagint. So he does, so that's why he's using that one. And that runs, you know, creation back, I think he said eight to 10,000 BC, depending on what set of Greek numbers you have. So I, I would go with the Dead Sea Scrolls instead. So love Doug, he's not a, a bad person or anything. We just have a different of agreement. I would follow the Hebrew and not even so much the Hebrew anymore, but the Dead Sea Scroll numbers. And that's just me. I mean, it's possible the Dead Sea Scroll numbers could be off too. So it's just one of those things we look for. Like the person talking about, has, does it have to start exactly on the seven-year mark? It's like, well, I would think it'd be pretty close, but, or and my leap week, maybe I'm off an entire week on everything. It's a possibility, or at least some years. So we'll see. So we don't want to ever ever uh, separate or disfellowship with something like that, with somebody looking at a scroll, trying to figure it out. But I would disagree with him on his conclusion. Uh, Super Chat, $5. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Again, we appreciate um, all that. You can come become a member and, and get in here. And we can also support through Give, Send, Go and other things. And we're trying to bump up the uh, subs and membership on YouTube. And that's why we're doing, again, just to mention real quickly, we're doing the 24-7 live stream. I want to try that for a while, and hopefully it doesn't confuse anybody, because it says on there that it's the best of our previously recorded stuff. And some of it's a little fuzzy, so that's why I wanted to do start with this, crystal clear. Hopefully this turns out really clear. Um, and then start redoing some of the things we did and uh, create those if it works well and we get more subscribers more members and more income for the ministry we might try making a couple of different 24 7 live streams and just kind of see what happens because i think some of you would like to go there and say okay this is all about dead sea scrolls Ooh, this is all about prophecy and maybe we would have one we're thinking of doing one with uh nothing but nephilim uh studies i think you guys would like that too uh, Nephilim demonic and prophecy too that goes along with it. So we'll see what happens in the future. So, okay, we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight. We'll come back next week and pick up where we left off and try to go studying the Roman Empire stuff. And I think it'll be interesting. God bless you guys. <laughs>